American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about how not one but two Catholics made it possible for General George Rogers Clark to defeat the British in the Northwest during the American Revolution. Now, I'm from Massachusetts, and I grew up 40 minutes from where the shot heard round the world was fired and conquered. So it's strange to think that there was major activity of the American Revolution happening as far west as western Indiana. Right. The British colonies and the territory in rebellion did extend all the way to the Mississippi River by that point. In order to secure a victory, the rebels had to defeat the British all over, so that meant General George Rogers Clark raising the troops to defeat them in the West. George Rogers Clark. Now, that's not a name that quickly comes up when talking about important figures in the Revolution. No, but it really should, given that what he accomplished in the Western theater was massively important. He's not one of the Catholics we're talking about, though. Right, he was Anglican. Clark was born and raised in Albemarle County, Virginia, which was Thomas Jefferson's home also. He was made a captain in the Virginia militia in 1774 at just 19 years old. When the war broke out, he was made a major in the militia of Kentucky County, where he led the fight against the British and their native allies. Kentucky County? Right. What is today the Commonwealth of Kentucky was at the time one big county of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So Clark was the officer in charge of defending the settlers in western Virginia against attacks by British-supplied natives. He knew that in order to end the attacks, he had to establish a foothold north of Virginia in the Northwest Territory. He especially focused on three cities, Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and Vincennes, with its nearby British garrison at Fort Sackville. And this is where the Catholics came in. Right. See, that whole area north of the Ohio and east of the Mississippi into Indiana had originally been settled by Frenchmen coming down from Canada. It was under British control at this point, but the people were still French, and that means Catholic. The British did not treat the Catholics well, confiscating land and restricting their freedom to be Catholic. The first Catholic we'll bring into the story is Father Pierre Gibault. Father Gibault was born in Montreal, Quebec in 1737, and after ordination in 1768, was stationed in the Illinois country, which included part of modern-day Indiana. He stayed for a time in Vincennes, a town on the Wabash River. Vincennes was the home of the first Catholic parish and cathedral in the modern state of Indiana, St. Francis Xavier. But eventually he made Kaskaskia his base of operations. Kaskaskia is on the Mississippi River in present-day Illinois, just downriver from St. Louis, Missouri. He became a much-loved priest throughout the area, so he became an important figure when the American Revolution came to the West in the late 1770s. Enter General Clark. Right. General Clark knew of Father Jabot's reputation and how beloved he was, and he also knew that since he could not rely on the Continental Army providing additional resources for his foray into the Northwest, he would have to make alliances with the settlers and what native tribes he could find that weren't already hostile to have any chance of defeating the British. So General Clark first set his sights on Kaskaskia, arriving there on July 4th, 1778. But something interesting happened at Kaskaskia. The Catholics of Kaskaskia and similar towns surrounding it had been treated terribly by the British, and so they assumed that a new non-Catholic army coming to town meant the same, that the men of the town could be pressed into service, or at a minimum, the town would be plundered for supplies. So to prepare for their fate, Father Jabot and the leaders of the town requested an opportunity to gather in the church. Clark, who of course had no intentions to conscript or to plunder, happily granted leave. And we'll let General Clark's own memoirs tell what happened next. Quote, They remained a considerable time in the church, after which the priest and many of the principal men came to me to return thanks for the indulgence shown them and begged permission to address me further on the subject that was more dear to them than anything else, that their present situation was the fate of war, that the loss of their property they could reconcile, but were in hopes that I would not part them from their families, and that the women and children might be allowed to keep some of their clothes and a small quantity of provisions." I asked them very abruptly whether or not they thought they were speaking to savages, that I was certain that they did from the tenor of their conversation. Did they suppose that we meant to strip the women and children, or take the bread out of their mouths, or that we would condescend to make war on the women or children or the church? 
It was to prevent the effusion of innocent blood by the Indians through the instigation of their commander's emissaries that caused us to visit them, and not the prospect of plunder, that as soon as that object was attained, we should be perfectly satisfied that as the King of France joined the Americans, there was a probability of there shortly being an end of the war. This information very apparently affected them. They were at liberty to take which side they pleased without any dread of losing their property or having their families destroyed. As for their church, all religions would be tolerated in America, and so far from intermeddling with it, that any insult offered to it should be punished, and to convince them that we were not savages and plunderers, as they had conceived, that they might return to their families and inform them that they might conduct themselves as usual, with all the freedom and without apprehensions of any danger. End quote. This assurance of religious and political freedom had a dramatic impact on Father Jabot and the residents of Kaskaskia, who all signed on to the American cause on the spot. Exactly. And their support wasn't just allegiance. It was material support, intelligence, and even peacefully winning other cities Clark had intended to attack to the American cause. And how did they manage that? Well, Clark told Father Jabot that he intended to go on from Kaskaskia to take Cahokia and Vincennes. Both towns were also inhabited by French Catholics, and Father Jabot had ministered in them a great deal. So he said, well, I've got a better idea. How about you let me and some of the other leaders from Kaskaskia go to those towns and tell them all about you and this whole religious and political liberty thing? Clark said, sure, and sent them with just a small guard to protect them and to establish a force in the towns. And it worked. So without firing a shot, General Clark took both Cahokia and Vincennes, as well as Fort Sackville. Now, it should be noted that Fort Sackville was not actually manned by British troops at the time, because the British didn't yet realize the threat. So the small band of Clark's troops was able to take the fort and set up a garrison immediately. Okay, so things are going pretty well for General Clark. He hadn't actually had to fire a shot to take a fair number of important towns, and now he's thinking about an assault on the main British base in Detroit. This is where we'll bring in the second vital Catholic, Francis Figo, a successful trader in the region who was based in nearby St. Louis. Right. Giuseppe Maria Francesco Vigo was born in 1747 in the Piedmont town of Mondovi in what is today northern Italy. As a youth, he signed on with the Spanish regiment, which was then stationed in New Orleans, Louisiana. Upon his discharge, he stayed in the New World, and by 1772, he was established as a fur trader in St. Louis and was then known as just Francis Vigo. New Orleans and St. Louis were both possessions of Spain at this point, but his work took him all over the region, including east of the Mississippi River, into British-controlled territory, and he soon developed pro-American sympathies. Exactly. So when General Clark showed up in nearby Kaskaskia and extended the assurance of religious liberty, Vigo was also eager to help as he could. And for him, that meant money and supplies. Right. Vigo became the most important financer of General Clark's efforts, offering supplies from his own stores and accepting the mostly worthless Virginia colonial cash that Rogers brought and exchanging it for real coinage that Clark could use to purchase supplies from locals. But money and supplies weren't all that Vigo did. No, he also did a fair amount of reconnaissance and intel work for General Clark. From his travels, he knew the land and he knew the people, including the native tribes. So he was able to provide a whole lot of valuable information to General Clark. And it was some of his information which saved the American force from a potentially devastating blow. Indeed. See, it didn't take long for the British lieutenant governor in Detroit, Henry Hamilton, to find out that he'd lost Fort Sackville, Vincennes, Cahokia, Kaskaskia, and a number of other towns. So in December of 1778, he led a large force to retake Fort Sackville in preparation for a larger campaign to crush the rebellion. By mid-December 1778, Fort Sackville was back in British hands. But Vizenz was not in British hands. The people had made up their minds that they were Americans. So while the British had the might, the people had the resolve. And that resolve would come in handy. Clark determined to retake Fort Sackville. He asked Francis Vigo to go check things out in Vincennes, find out the size of the force, what their plans were, and whatever else he could ascertain. On this mission, Vigo was actually taken prisoner by some natives who were allies of the British and who believed Vigo to be a spy. They turned him over to the British who held him captive on parole in Fort Sackville. Vigo denied being a spy and protested that as a Spanish subject, he was officially a non-combatant and thus it was unlawful to hold him. Hamilton suspected him of being a spy, so he intended to hold him, 
But then something unexpected happened. With the people peacefully revolted. Right. Father Jabot went to Vincennes, where he organized the people to demand Vigo's release. If the British did not release Vigo, the people promised to cut off all supplies to the fort. It worked. Vigo was released. But on one condition, Hamilton made him swear that as he returned to St. Louis, he would not tell General Clark anything. Vigo swore to it and left. And he kept his word. He did keep his word. He went straight back to St. Louis. And then, his oath fulfilled, he promptly went to Kaskaskia, where he informed General Clark of all he had learned, including that the British intended to come out in force in the spring of 1779 to crush Clark's army. The only thing to do was to carry out a daring and difficult preemptive attack on Fort Sackville during the winter when it was not at all expected. Precisely. It was do or die at this point. So on February 6, after an address of encouragement and a blessing from Father Jabot, General Clark and his men set out on foot to trek the 90 plus miles in terrible wintry conditions to Vincennes. They arrived on February 23rd and launched a surprise attack. Two days later, Hamilton surrendered Fort Sackville and was himself captured in the process. It was a massive victory for the American forces. Word made it to the East, and the importance of the victory and General Clark's heroism was talked about and recognized by everyone up to George Washington. Clark was especially lauded for accomplishing this with no support from the main body of the Continental Army and practically no funding. But the credit wasn't given to Clark alone. The names of Vigo and Jabot also figured prominently in the recognitions lavished back east. Yes, their contributions were noted from early on. Clark wrote of Vigo, quote, In short, we got every information from this gentleman that we could wish for as he had good opportunities and had taken great pains to inform himself with a design to give intelligence. Father Jabot, for his part, became known as the Patriot Priest. Years later, a judge in Vincennes wrote of Father Jabot, To him, next to Clark and Vigo, the United States are more indebted for the accession of the states comprised in what was the original Northwestern Territory than to any other man. After the victory, Clark continued planning for his desired assault on Detroit, but it never materialized. He was never able to raise enough men to sign on to such a cause. Kentucky men, it seemed, were more interested in staying closer to home. Detroit was too far. But what Clark had accomplished with the help of Father Jabot and Figo was to pacify the West, secure the Northwest Territory for the new United States, and help make the revolution end more quickly. After the war, Father Jabot moved around a bit in that part of the country. At one point, he pressed a claim to personal ownership of the land on which sat the parish church and the rectory in Cahokia, Illinois. He reasoned that since he had sold land that he owned to help finance the Revolutionary War, he had a claim to this piece of land. At the time, the federal government was actively seeking to make good on claims for recompense such as his. President George Washington was prepared to award him ownership of the land, but John Carroll, who had recently been named the first Bishop of Baltimore, and thus the Bishop of the entire United States, objected, saying that that property should belong to the church and not to an individual priest. Father Jabot was not given the land and was never compensated for his expenditures during the war. Shortly after that disappointment, and with no hope of ever being compensated for his wartime expenditures, Father Jabot left the United States, moving across the Mississippi into Spanish territory, where he became pastor of the parish in the recently settled town of New Madrid. He died there in 1802. Father Chabot is commemorated with large statues in both St. Genevieve, Missouri and Vincennes, Indiana, where his statue stands in front of the old cathedral of St. Francis Xavier. Francis Vigo settled in Vincennes after the war. He continued his fur trading business and remained very active as a colonel in the militia and helping to establish Jefferson Academy, which is now Vincennes University, the oldest institution of higher learning in the Northwest Territory. In 1818, Vigo County, Indiana was named for him. Like Father Jabot, he attempted multiple times to recoup the monies he had spent to support the fight for independence. He always met with disappointment. Near the end of his life, his businesses faltered and he died penniless in Vincennes in 1836. In his will, however, he stipulated that should the government ever pay back what they owed him, a portion of it should go to purchasing a bell for the town hall in Terre Haute, which is the county seat of Vigo County. In 1875, in 1875, nearly a century after he had incurred the expenses, the government finally did agree to pay him back $8,016 with interest, which amounted to $41,282.60. 
But since he had no living descendants, the only amount the government actually had to pay was the amount to purchase the bell for the Vigo County Courthouse in Terre Haute. In 1936, a statue of Francis Vigo was dedicated along the Wabash River in Vincennes, fittingly situated within George Rogers Clark National Historical Park. Two Catholic men, one a priest, one laity, who both played pivotal roles in the War for American Independence. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to give us a rating and a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on social media at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. Sorry, and I'm, and I'm still laughing.